members of the British government have criticised Parliament for removing their negotiating leverage by passing an act to make a no deal all but impossible. The man at the centre of the parliamentary debate, literally, who's known for trying to keep order, is John Burke. Order! Burko has announced that he'll step down as Speaker by October the 31st, the day that Britain could leave the EU. In an exclusive interview, I spoke to him about breaking the Brexit impasse. A potential way to resolve the deadlock, which has been put forward in some reports in the British press, has been a national unity government. And most recently, there's been talk of the fact that some people would like you to lead that. Is that something you'd ever consider? I think that is absolutely unreasonable. I don't think anybody would seriously think that that is a likely resolution. And if you're saying, am I sort of sitting by my phone and thinking people are going to come to me and say, John, rescue us from the imbroglio? The answer is, I expect nothing of the sort, and I'm looking for nothing of the sort. And I am, in fact, very much looking forward instead to leaving the speakership. One of the most challenging aspects of being the speaker, which we talked about before is that you have to be politically neutral you have to abandon any previous political allegiances that you have now you are human have you ever failed at that i've certainly made mistakes i think that is almost unavoidable and so sometimes people have said ah the ruling that he gave there was more helpful to the opposition than to the government now most of the time i would stand by that and say yes I made the ruling that I made not to help the opposition rather than the government, but to help the scrutiny of the people who wield the levers of power. Specifically, on Brexit, if you were to cast your mind back a number of years, all the evidence is that when the Conservative government was anti-Brexit, wanted to remain in the EU under the leadership of David Cameron, I gave the Brexit-supporting minority, which was an important voice, a chance to be heard. I granted them urgent questions, I allowed them to have emergency debates, because those opinions needed to be heard. In more recent times, seeing that the minority voices on the government benches have been Remainers, that is to say those who are anti-Brexit, or the voices of people who wanted to have a much softer Brexit, I've thought, well, those voices must be heard, and I've given them their chance to be heard. And now the Brexiteers are inclined to cry foul and say, oh, no, that can't be right. But wait a minute. I thought the Brexiteers were in favour of taking back control of Parliament being in the driving seat. Well, they can't have it both ways. I think if people think in the sporting context, they usually accept this proposition. If you are performing badly or losing the match, it's quite bad form to blame the referee. It's up to those who want to get their way to come up with the proposals that people will support and to win. And if they can't win, to put it bluntly, that's not my fault. So you would reject then, you say that you enable parliamentary discussion, that you're a Remainer enabler? So, no, I'm not a Remainer enabler, Bianca. That distorts it. I'm an enabler of the House to reach the view it wants to reach. Just quickly, throughout history, parliaments have been given names, like the Rump Parliament, the Long Parliament, the Happy Parliament. What would you call this one? <laughs> The rumbustious parliament, and that would be a polite way of putting it. And I like the passion, and I don't disapprove of anger. There's always been anger in parliament. This is not an Oxford Union debating society. There are real and live issues being aired. And so a lot of the passion and the cut and thrust represent a very good thing. It's only when it just goes over the edge and elides into uncontrolled anger and abuse that it becomes a very bad thing. Let's talk about the tone of Parliament, yes. because this is something that within the chamber and outside of it has been a topic of discussion, especially in recent weeks. In the time that you've been not just Speaker, but a member of Parliament, so 22 years here, have you ever known the tone to be this bad with the level of attacks from MP against MP in the chamber? No. I've never known it as rancorous and sometimes as shocking 
as it has been. For the avoidance of doubt, I am not here to badmouth or rubbish my colleagues. Indeed, when they're under attack, including now, I still want to accentuate the positive and say all the good things about parliamentarians, the vast majority of whom are in the House of Commons for reasons of public service. They work incredibly hard. They're extremely focused. They're very dedicated. They're motivated by principle. They are motivated by their notion of the national interest, by their perception of the public good, and by their duty, not as delegates, but as representatives to do what they believe to be right for our country. The most moving moment of the interview was when I showed Burko clips of his statements to the House of Commons on key days throughout his speakership, some amusing, some formative, and some deeply tragic. I reminded him of what he said the day after the murder of Labour MP Joe Cox. Her legacy has been at the forefront of MPs' minds lately, and her name often mentioned in parliamentary debates. Here's how John Burko responded. Any death... <coughs> in such awful circumstances is an outrage and a tragedy. Yet this death, in this manner, of this person, our democratically elected colleague, Joe Cox, is particularly shocking and repugnant. Well, of course, I remember that still very keenly and the sentiment is very raw. There are many people, Bianca, in the House of Commons who knew Jo Cox much better than I did. I knew her only from when she was elected in May 2015 for the first time to when she was brutally murdered 13 months later. Her legacy, you asked me earlier about conduct, behaviour. Really, Joe was a great exponent of that principle of political difference, personal amiability. It should be possible for us as Democrats to disagree agreeably.